During the 1960s, the feeling was that the USSR was far ahead of the United States in the field of tank design. In 1961, the Soviets put the T-62 into production, the first tank with a revolutionary smoothbore gun that could fire fin-stabilised darts at speeds of up to a mile a second. Just a few years later, they put an even larger smoothbore gun onto their next vehicle, the T-64, which also featured incredibly strong composite armour known as Combination K, the first of its kind. America's newest tank at the time was the M60, a largely unremarkable design with regular steel armour and a rifled 105mm gun. So how had the Americans fallen so far behind? Well, they hadn't. Not really. Because the T-62 wasn't the first vehicle to have a smoothbore gun nor was the T-64 the first tank to be built from composite armour. Enter T-95. But not that T-95. T-95 was a series of American medium tank prototypes that predated the T-62, designed and built in the mid-50s. T-95 tanks were the first to mount smoothbore guns. T-95 hulls were the first to be built using composite armour. It was the first tank to have a light-based rangefinder and some models even had 152mm missile launchers and hydro-pneumatic suspension systems. They were poised to enter production as the most advanced combat vehicles ever built. Except, the T-95 would never enter service. Only 9 vehicles were ever built, 5 of these have been lost completely. Despite being one of the most revolutionary and forward-thinking projects of all time, the T-95 ended in failure. So that begs the question. What happened to the T-95 program, and why was the M60 so mundane? This is the story of the futuristic super tanks that America chose to leave behind. Before we get into it, I want to show you something else I've been working on, my family tree. I've partnered with MyHeritage, the number one family history service. I didn't know all that much about my family past my own grandparents, but with MyHeritage I was able to find out a pretty crazy amount going back over 200 years. Turns out my great 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 grandfather was a guy called Thomas Knox, born in 1816. I found all this out using the more than 20 billion historical documents that my heritage has available. You put in a few key details, for example a certain family member, and it will find matches in other family trees and public records to help you fill in the gaps in your family history. Finding these links and sharing them with my grandfather was a special moment for us. That and he was a lot of help filling in the details providing photos like this, which MyHeritage can restore, enhance, and animate. After all, the more details you add, the more matches you get, and the more history you can discover. And on this channel, of course, it's the more history, the better. Sign up for MyHeritage now using the link in the description to start your 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer. But for now, less family history, more military history. At the Question Mark III conference in 1954, American scientists, engineers and military leaders reviewed a series of innovative armoured vehicle designs. We care about three of these, TL1, TL4 and TS31. Later that year, these designs were refined into three programmes, T95, T96 and T110, which would be armed with 90, 105 and 120mm guns respectively. But Designers soon realised that by increasing the T-95's turret ring diameter to 85 inches, the same as the M48 pattern that was currently in service, the better armoured T-95 hull could mount the T-96 turret with a bigger gun, albeit with a drop in mobility. So the T-96 hull was cancelled completely. The T-110 was also cancelled at this point, as the T-43E2, the prototype of the M103, was performing a lot better in testing than had been expected. So, now we're down to one design, T-95, of which 9 vehicles were to be built. 4 would mount the T-95 turret with the rigidly mounted 90mm smoothbore gun T-208. 4 would mount the T-96 turret with the rigidly mounted 105mm gun T-210. And 1 would mount the T-95 turret and the 90mm T-208 with an actual recoil system. While these were being built, the designers used this opportunity to sort of lose it a little bit. Like a kid in a candy store, they wanted more. They wanted it all. They set about investigating pretty much every gun that could fit into that turret. 
the M103 is 120mm, the 105mm gun of the T-54E2, the 120mm gun mounted on the British Chieftain, the 105mm gun from the British Centurion, a 105mm boosted rocket launcher, a special casemate version that fired wire-guided dart missiles, the entire turret of the M48A2, or perhaps a liquid propellant gun that used rocket fuel instead of gunpowder. They even seriously considered mounting the entire Chieftain turret and 120mm gun onto the T-95 chassis and selling it to Canada. After the dust had settled, they decided that a derivative of the British gun would probably work the best. But that was a future problem. A current problem was that the T-95 turrets would be ready a lot sooner than the T-96 turrets. So, they decided to mount existing M48A2 patent turrets to two of the hulls, and the turrets of the failed T-54E2 onto another two. These came with new, fun designations that I promise you, you will forget. The nine prototypes were to be built as follows. The tanks with chassis numbers 4, 7, 8 and 9 were pure T-95s, with a T-95 turret and the rigid, smoothbore 90mm gun. Chassis number 5 was given the designation T-95E1, and was identical apart from the fact it mounted the gun in a normal recoiling mount. Chassis 1 and 3 were T-95E2s with the M48 turret. Chassis number 2 and 6 were T-95E3s with the turret of the T-54E2. All four of these were to become T-95E4s when they were eventually fitted with the turret from the T-96. And this is confusing, I know, so we will move swiftly on. The first T-95 was completed in May of 1957 at the Detroit Arsenal, and was equipped with a turret of the M48, which, as I'm sure you'll remember, makes it a T-95E2. Over the next year and a half, the other eight would be completed and shipped all over the country, bouncing between Aberdeen, Yuma, Fort Knox and Fort Benning. So now we know the origin story, let's get into the super powers of these super tanks. Firstly, the big ticket item, the gun. It's difficult to overstate just how powerful the 90mm smoothbore was for that time period, especially for its size. Mounted on the four T95s and the single T95E1, the T208 had a muzzle velocity of over 1500 meters per second, with the tungsten penetrator of its T320 AP FSDS rounds capable of slicing through 5 inches of sloped armor at ranges of over 1800 meters. There were some accuracy issues compared to the rifled 90mm of the pattern, but these were being worked on. An advanced fire control system was mounted inside the turret, but not to the turret itself. It was attached via a shock absorbing mount on the turret ring, meaning that it would be resistant to any impacts or thermal expansion of the turret's steel. Part of this fire control system was this large sphere on the starboard side of the turret. This was the Optar system a precursor of the laser rangefinder that worked by emitting a pulse of infrared light and, by reading the return signal, could determine how far away an object was, meaning that you could accurately blast it with your futuristic smoothbore space gun. The crew and armour layouts are relatively straightforward. The driver sat in the centre of the front plate, the gunner sat on the right side of the turret in front of the commander, with the loader on the left. Roughly the first half of the hull was comprised of a steel armour casting, with the rear section being constructed from welded steel plates. The upper plate was 95mm and raked back at 65 degrees, with the lower plate ranging from 76mm all the way up to 127. The welded rear and sides were only around 30mm thick. The turret was better protected, 381mm at the very front, 178mm at the angled cheeks, 76mm on the sides and 51 at the rear. The vehicle had excellent frontal protection, but the sides and rear were sacrificed so the tank could remain somewhat mobile. And of course, on the turret roof, a big dirty Browning 50 cal in an armoured cupola, as if the Americans were ever going to forget that. Supporting the vehicle were five dual road wheels on each side, connected by torsion bar suspension. The designers omitted the support rollers on the top, saving weight and allowing the tank to have a lower profile than its patent cousins. An XTG-410-1 transmission connected the wheels to the 8-cylinder opposed piston AOI-1195-5 engine 
that put out a modest 560 horsepower. The fuel tanks were rather bravely constructed from fiberglass, molded to fit perfectly into the gaps made for them in the engine compartment. And that pretty much sums up the T95. The E1 was largely identical, but had a recoil system for its gun. As for the T95 E2 and T95 E3, the Franken tanks with the M48 and T54 turrets, these were mainly used as automotive test vehicles at Fort Knox, where they were putting the hull through its paces. And these automotive tests were proving problematic, with all signals pointing to the T95 having inferior mobility to the M48 A2 it was sort of meant to be replacing. Tests were carried out with wider tracks and a modified suspension to try and alleviate these problems, while other testing and development continued. And continue it did. Notably on the E4 and the E6, the vehicles with T96 turrets and 105mm or 120mm guns respectively. But the dimensions of these guns and mountings had changed and required the T96 turrets to be redesigned to be somewhat larger. And there was another problem. They were too long, meaning that there was barely enough space behind the breech to load the shells. The 120mm rounds were in two parts, so that was okay. But the 105mm rounds were single piece and nearly 50 inches or 1.25 meters long. This meant the 105mm gun on the E4 had to be pushed way forward, throwing the entire mount out of balance. While they figured this out, attention turned back to the hull, composite armour. The US had been conducting tests with siliceous cord armour and it was proving incredibly effective against shape charge attacks while performing around the same against regular kinetic penetrators. The way this worked was to simply sandwich a layer of special glass between two slabs of armour. See, when metal is hit by a shape charge jet or a big shell, it deforms plastically. This means when it deforms, it stays deformed. It gets pushed out of the way and it stays there. Glass, however, deforms elastically. This means there is a tendency to try and return to its original state. Naturally, this doesn't really apply if you smash a window or drop your pint, but in the split second during which the penetrator jet is trying to push through the glass before it's had time to crack or shatter, it absorbs a portion of the energy and bounces it back into the jet, disrupting it enough that it penetrates significantly less of the inner armour panel and, hopefully, saves the tank. A US Army Tank Automotive Command report from the 8th of November 1958 outlines the material science going on in more detail if you want to read that. It also contains information that T95 hulls were cast using siliceous cord armour, meaning that the vehicle was technically the first to ever be constructed from composites, despite these hulls never being built into functional vehicles. There were further hulls planned, and even some T96 turrets were set to be fully cast using this technique. But you may have noticed the title of this report, Evaluation of Siliceous Cord Armour for the XM60 Tank. Even by that point, late 1958, it was clear that the T95 was not going to be America's next battle tank. It was, instead, going to be the M60, a stopgap solution putting an American version of the L7 105mm gun into the M48 pattern, along with a newer, more reliable engine. Despite all the positives to come out of the T95 project, none of them were reliable enough to deploy en masse. The engine wasn't all that efficient, giving the vehicle relatively low operational range. The long, thin 90mm smoothbore gun suffered from thermal distortion, making it inaccurate at longer ranges. The tracks weren't wide enough, and the vehicle struggled in deep mud. The Optar Pulse Light Rangefinder would give false readings in any sort of adverse weather, and was still very vulnerable on the side of the turret. The long promised T96 turrets and with the bigger guns were still in development and any gun mounted in them may not have been balanced well. So the T95, while promising, was simply taking too long. However, there was still life left in the program. There were capable, modern hulls and high-tech turrets that could still be used. The main source for this video, after all, is Hanukkah's book on the M1 Abrams. Four vehicles were quickly re-engined with a GM 12V71T diesel and redesignated the T95E8. One of these vehicles was fitted with an improved smoothbore 120mm gun firing delta wing darts in the hope that these could overcome the thermal distortion issue. T95 was also the testbed for the cutting edge MGM51 Shillelagh, 
152mm anti-tank guided missile, one of the first mature designs of its kind. Developed for the unsuccessful MBT-70, it would go on to arm the M60A2 and the M551 Sheridan, albeit with mixed reviews. One of the T95E8s was re-engined again with a solar Saturn gas turbine, the same type of power plant that would eventually be found in the Abrams. Meanwhile, three chassis were fitted with brand new hydropneumatic suspension systems, allowing the driver to manually change the clearance of each suspension arm, tilting or lowering the vehicle as he wished. This improved cross-country mobility, increasing ground clearance, and giving the vehicle a lower centre of gravity. Sadly, the fate of most of the vehicles is unknown. Four survive today in collections in various states of disrepair. One, at some point, was turned into this monstrosity, only known as Mr. Mo, a fate maybe worse than the scrapyard. But it was not all doom and gloom. The T95 project was incredibly productive for American and NATO armoured vehicle design. Pioneering work on systems like laser rangefinders, smoothbore guns, gas turbine engines, and composite armour. The program resulted in the American 105mm M68 that armed the M60 and the M1 Abrams, along with a whole host of other Western designs. The T95 turret with a 105mm gun was even adapted for the M60A1, an improved variant of one of America's most successful vehicles. The endless innovation of the project was the T95's greatest strength, but also its greatest weakness. Innovation, after all, takes time. The Americans simply didn't think they had time to spare. And maybe they were right. It was unacceptable to have M48 patterns facing down T62s and T64s. Regardless, I think it's an incredibly interesting vehicle, and I hope you've enjoyed learning about it as much as I have. Thank you again to MyHeritage for sponsoring this video. Remember to click the link in the description or the pinned comment to start your free 14-day trial and start learning about your family history. If you did enjoy, please do consider subscribing or even think about joining these lovely people on my Patreon who got this video early and ad-free for just $2. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one.